Hey guys, Brad Gilmore here. Want to give a big shout out to our title sponsor, Walker Texas Lawyer. If you or a loved one have been injured in an accident, whether that be a car, truck, motorcycle accident, or some kind of other issue, hit up Walker Texas Lawyer at 713-552-1117 or walkertexaslawyer.com. Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world, and around the world, TV host, best-selling author, and radio personality, Brad Gilmore, brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Matthew McConaughey. Brad Gilmore. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Great introduction. <laughs> Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripa. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Chris Tucker is in the building. Chris Tucker, good morning to you. Hey, Brad, good morning to you. How are you? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The legendary frontman of ACDC, Brian Johnson, joins us right now. Brian, how you doing? Good morning, Brad. What lucky to talk to me. Funny lad. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is, is the, the collection. collection. Now, now your host, host the, the boat, boat, Brad, Brad Gilmore. Gilmore. And I am so excited to be joined right now by one of the stars, one of the cast members of Beetlejuice, which is going to be here in Houston March 5th through the 10th at the Hobby Center. Tickets available at thehobbycenter.org or at Broadway at thehobbycenter.com. She's playing Delia, the one and only Sarah Litzinger. Sarah, how are you? I'm doing great. And yourself? I'm wonderful. Man, look, Beetlejuice, I think for people at least, it, 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 when all in all generations, but especially mine, that was like a go-to comfort food movie for me a lot of the times. You know, I love that movie. It's so innovative. It's so original. And I actually remember seeing promotions for this musical, must have been maybe over a year ago, that they were coming to the Hobby Center, and now we're here. How excited should we all be in Houston? Oh, the most excited ever. (laughs) It's so much fun. It's such a wild ride. And it stays true to the movie, but it's got some new twists, I think, that you will enjoy, and as well as the audiences. So So how did how did Beetlejuice land in your atmosphere? Like what 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 brought you to this project? Well, I had an audition for it and um, I had not seen the show at the time, but I also just uh, am in love with the movie. And uh, I play Catherine O'Hara's part, Delia. Right. And um, her part was so memorable in the film. So when I had an audition, I I was thrilled. I just feel like I can relate to the character because she's kind of <laughs> wacky and quirky. Um, and that audition process was sort of a three-day boot camp, if you will. I had um, my initial audition, and then I got called back for the next day um, with Alex Timbers, uh, there, who's the director of the show. And um, and then I had another callback for producers the next day. And so it was kind of a whirlwind. Um, and then uh, I didn't hear anything for a while. And then eventually they gave me a, a jingle and offered me the role. So I'm very excited. For a show this magnitude and size, how much goes into the rehearsal? Pro- I mean, obviously that's all Broadway. I mean, not all, but a large part of, of what makes that show happen is rehearsal, 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 rehearsal. Was right. this one akin to other productions that you have been a part of? Or was it more or less? How do you how do you relate it? Right. So I'm a replacement, uh, meaning that they rehearsed the show initially when they opened the tour. I'm right. not sure. They probably rehearsed for, I would say, four to six weeks. Um, and since I joined the show a year after it opened, my rehearsal process was a couple of weeks. So um <laughs> I've learned roles in less time, but uh, this, it it felt fast, but I also felt ready because the creative team um, was really great at at getting me ready as well as the production team here on the road. They're very organized and um, they have, it's a well-oiled machine. So um, it it was uh, an easy yet slightly nerve wracking 
process. But now that I'm in the show, I, I feel like uh, it's it's going really well. For actors who are on film, you know, say they get a script, they've got time to read it. They've got several weeks before we actually start rolling on the film. And then you get more than one take, uh, you know, not, differently yeah. than a Broadway production where you get the one live performance, you know, that night. Right. Um, what coming on late and having that two weeks to kind of prepare for it, what is your preparation to make sure you're going to nail this character? Like, what are your strategies that you implement? Um, for me, it's just a lot of a practice of uh, making sure that I'm on my lines and, and know my dialogue backwards and forwards, um, but just really rehearsal. You know, preparation is really the key, I think, for any, you know, sort of success in anything, it's just being prepared. So and practicing the, my song. I have a I have a fun song that I get to sing. So um, just making sure that, you know, I know my blocking. Blocking is uh, where you go on stage. So just knowing how to find your light and making sure you're in the right spot so that you're not in the dark. <laughs> and then just, you know, a wing and a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it has to be. I'm sure it's happened. I'm, all, I'm always kind of fascinated by this because somebody told me a long time ago, it can't go wrong if it's live, right? I mean, there's always a way that you can kind of manipulate what's happening on stage. I've all, I'm, so I'm curious when I get to talk to yeah. stage actors and stage performers, have you had that actor's nightmare where you go out and you hit your mark and then you're like, what's the line? Uh, yeah, luckily not in this show. Knock on glass, wood. Oh, there's wood there. Um, but I have gone, they call it going up or they call it going into the white room. So it's it's, it's just all time and and time stops pretty much if you forget your lines. I've had a, I had one little scare where I slightly went up on a line. This was about a month ago and boy, my heart rate went up. <laughs> I remembered it. It was like a split second, but because when you go into the white room, time slows down. It seems like an hour before you remember sure. the, the next time, but it's a split second. You know, yeah. to me, lot, there's nothing that beats live performing. And my wife and I, in the last couple of years, have made a concerted effort to see more things in the theater or to see more Broadway productions. We were in New York in October and got to see Back to the Future, the musical, um, which is right. another great 80s film that has now been adapted into musical form and did phenomenal job. There's a DeLorean flying over the audience. It's crazy. Um to me, do you feel like there is no better high as a performer than having that live experience with the audience because you get that instant feedback? A thousand percent. That's really, um, it is. It's that instant feedback. And Beetlejuice is a show that just has so many hilarious moments. It's such a wild ride that um, getting that feedback, it is, um, it's, it's a high. It just feels so great. It's got to be nice, too, to do a comedy. Obviously, drama and comedy, um, they both have their pros and cons into it. You know, when we saw uh, Aaron Sorkin's version of To Kill a Mockingbird that came to the Hobby Center uh, maybe six, eight months ago, I mean, very dramatic play, but it had its nice moments of levity, um, but you were kind of zoned in. But I, I feel like for a comedy, especially a musical, you're going to go to really enjoy and have fun. And and it's it's I'm sure it's a... Um, uh, quite a raucous production. That's a really great word to describe it. It's <laughs> raucous, it's irreverent. But the interesting thing about the show too is that it really has heart. And I think that's sort of an unexpected um, addition to the show that, you know, it, it kind of surprises you that there's this sort of heartfelt, there's some heartfelt moments do you still have the nerves before you step out every night or do those kind of dissipate? Oh, they, you still got them. <laughs> they do dissipate, but yes, um, I, I can be a little bit of a nervous Nelly. So, um, uh, but that's also why we, or why I do it. I love that feeling of, Ooh, you know, what's going to happen. It's live theater. It's, you know, okay, here we go. You know? Uh, and that's, I think part of the reason why I do what I do. Um, again, Beatles is going to be here in Houston, March the 5th through the 10th. Tickets available at thehobbycenter.org. 
when you have a property, like you said, that's based on this iconic film from the 1980s and Michael Keaton and Catherine O'Hara and all the names that were in that movie, you say it stays true to it, but adds its new twist. How much do you rely on the blueprint that Catherine O'Hara laid down or do you try to make your own take at it? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I love her quirkiness and, you know, she has sort of a little bit of those oddities, you know, which it's fun to sort of just sort of grab from that and use her as inspiration since she is the blueprint for the role. Um, But because the show does sort of expand on the characters a bit, um, I feel like there's room to add my own interpretation. Yeah, I feel like it would, as an audience member going, you you have these expectations of the film, um, but I'm sure as soon as kind of that first twist goes, everyone's like, oh, wait a minute, this is something else. This isn't what we were expecting. And it, and yes. it hooks you in and draws you in even more. Um, where did this Broadway journey start for you? M- me being on Broadway? Yeah, just in general. Yeah. Take oh, me back gosh. to the beginning. Well, let's, let's go way, way back. <laughs> um, I made my Broadway debut when I was 11 years old in a Broadway flop called Marilyn, an American fable. It was a Broadway show about Marilyn Monroe, so, sort of like Smash, the musical before Smash ever existed. Okay. Um, I was 11, and I think the show, we had four weeks of previews. That's before the show opens. They call them previews. And once the show opened, it, it got terrible reviews. And I think that we closed maybe three days later. I don't even think we lasted a week. (laughs) Um, But then after that, I did Oliver, um, the revival on Broadway with Ron Moody, who plays Fagin in the movie. And Patti Lapone was um, Nancy and I played Bette. So before the age of 12, I did two Broadway shows and then I toured with the national tour of Annie. So I was sort of a showbiz kid. And um, that was always my dream was just to be on stage and, uh, I was doing it at a very young age. So when I sort of moved into a career as an adult, it felt very natural because I'd been performing basically my whole life. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you started 11 um, on Broadway. Let me ask you though. When I was even younger. So to do something like the, uh, the American fable, the Maryland American fable, and you do all these rehearsals, you have the four weeks of previews and then, three days into the show or whatever it was, it's over <laughs> with. Do you, uh, do you even have like the ability at that age to understand like, Oh, the show's over now and and what that really meant or, or for you, how did you take that? How did you take that news at that age? I, I don't think I remember having any sort of feelings about it. Maybe it just, I wasn't processing that it was, Oh, and now it's over. And Oliver ran a bit longer. And then later in my career, um, I played Belle and Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. And that was, you know, a much longer run because it was a Broadway smash hit. I also did Les, Mis- Les Miserables on Broadway as well. Um, and I would say uh, I, I did another Broadway flop called Amour. Um, and that ran for, I want to say, about a month. And so uh, I remember the reviews weren't great for that show. So when we got closing notice, it wasn't a surprise. <laughs> I was disappointed, but it wasn't a surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, um, but that's why when, it's great to be. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Finish. I was gonna say that's why it's great to be in in a hit like Beetlejuice. The audiences are insane and and so wonderful. And every night when we go out on stage, it feels like we're rock stars. It's an amazing feeling. The, the fans are incredible and, and we're in a bona fide hit. So I'm, I'm really lucky. <laughs> it's a hot ticket. Trust me. I've been talking to friends and colleagues of mine where, you know, they're having to even sit in separate parts of the theater just so that they can get in because it's such a hot <laughs> ticket. Again, tickets are still available March 5th through the 10th. Beetlejuice is playing at the hobby center, the hobby center.org for tickets. Um, you know, I was talking to Malcolm McDowell, you know, who's an actor you know, known for Clockwork Orange and, and things like that. And and he's in a new comedy on television. But I was asking him, you know, you go from these roles like a Clockwork Orange and now you're playing these comedy parts. What's the best piece of advice someone gave you about comedy? And he says you play it straight. 
You act like it's it's you're not making a joke. It's actually happening to you. You're nodding your head in agreement. Would you agree with that? Yes. That's how you play a good comedy. Absolutely, play it true always. Don't don't uh, don't comment on the comedy. That's the way to not get a laugh. But if you just play it true, then the laugh will be there. And also, I try to remind myself because my character is a funny character. Um, sure. And you hear the laughs live on stage that I always remind myself before each show, don't don't pay attention to what the audience is doing. Stay in the moment with with my scene partners, because that it's like if you're kind of leaning towards the laughs or hear, oh, that laugh wasn't as strong or, oh, it's a big laugh tonight with this audience. It can take you out of the moment. So I think as long as you're always just playing it true and you're just staying in the moment, you can't fail. But that should, that's probably so hard to not want to, you know, react to what the people are giving you, especially when, like you said, maybe it's a huge laugh or maybe it's normally a huge laugh, but it's, this one's a bit quieter. Did it take time to not allow those outside interferences to impact your performance? I think at first, when I first started the show as a replacement, mm-hmm. um, it, it's odd. My first few performances on, I didn't hear any of the laughs. It was almost like my senses were overwhelmed by the lights and the orchestra and all of that, just getting used to the, to the sounds and the feelings of being on stage that I, I I heard nothing. It was almost like I was blacking out. But then as I started doing more and more performances, I started to hear the rhythms of the the laughs in the show. So it is important to to hear where the, the laughs are, but then then ultimately move on from then once you get your rhythm and you know where they are, then to kind of, you know, distance yourself, you know, from the audience and stay in the moment. So it's, it's a little bit of a transition uh, being a replacement in a show in that regard. So a a, a couple of, a couple of final things before I let you go. And thank you for so much making time for this. I'm really appreciative and and, and thank you for being gracious. Um, Again, Beetlejuice is going to be at the hobby center, hobbycenter.org for tickets. Um, are there any like rituals that you do prior to an on uh, to, to going on stage as an actor? Cause I know, I mean, I've done live performances in different arenas, obviously not Broadway. Um, but you know, I have my quirks that I got to go through and I got to have a certain thing that happens. Is it the same for you? And if so, could you share those? Are you comfortable sharing what those quirks might be? Um, I am absolutely the same <laughs> as you. Uh, I have my, my pre-show, uh, routine that I follow. Um, and uh, I wish that I could be looser because I see people like Justin, who plays Beetlejuice. He sings in his dressing room. He plays guitar. He blasts like rock music. And he's just so free. And he's so free on stage, which is amazing. And his character, you know, he is um, full of chaos on stage, but it's controlled chaos. And, you know, he, he does different things every night, but his character can do that because he relates to the audience, whereas the other characters in the show don't. So I'm, I'm very sort of set in how I, you know, do my pre-show stuff. When I uh, warm up, I sing a little bit of my song at places um, just to make sure that my voice is there. Um, Uh, And then I put my costume on at a certain point in the show because I make my entrance about 20 minutes into the show. So I have a, you know, a specific time that I do that. So, but I'm a superstitious person and that's just my way. And I wish I could be more like Justin, but I'm just not wired that way. You just are who you are, Sarah Lissinger. You are who you are. Now, uh, my final my final question for you again. I cannot wait to see this. Everybody's been buzzing about Beetlejuice, and I can't recommend enough. If you can get a ticket to the show, it's not something you want to miss. It's a hit, and Sarah Litzinger's in it. That's why it's a hit, and one of the many reasons why it's a hit. Um, but I want to ask, other, other than your big number that you you said that you had, which one do you look for forward to the most every night, either hearing or seeing on stage from the production? Oh my goodness. There are so many hilarious songs in the show. I I don't know that I could pick a favorite. Um, Oh my gosh. Uh, Eddie Perfect, who's the composer, just, I don't know. He's just a comic genius with these songs because you really have to listen to the lyrics when people are singing the song because they're, they're so 
hilarious. But um, I would say, okay, I'm going to go with a non-hilarious song. Uh, Lydia, played by Isabella Esler, who's absolutely fantastic in the show. Um, she sings a song in the second act called Home. And it's it's one of the more poignant songs in the show. And I think that one gets me because it's so touching. And it's that's that unexpected moment where you're like, oh my gosh, the show has made, like I'm my sides are splitting from laughing, but then you get to this moment and you're like, oh, okay, here's, here's the heart. Here's the heart, heart of the show. Well, yeah. Beetlejuice offers it all and we cannot wait for it to be here in Houston, Texas at the Hobby Center. Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time. Congratulations on the hit. And I can't wait to see you belt out a couple of choice numbers at the Hobby Center. Thank you.